We are so uh, thankful that you're here today. What a beautiful weekend it was, huh? We just had beautiful weather. And I have been especially thankful for that weather with the Masters being this weekend. It's just been a, been a great weekend. Um, but in these good times, and there comes bad times, but we always need to be thankful even on a rainy Monday. If the rain comes tomorrow, that's okay. We're thankful in all circumstances. I found a, a verse here in uh, 1 Thessalonians. It says, always be joyful, never stop praying, be thankful in all circumstances, for this is God's will for you who belong to Christ Jesus. I'm thankful you're here. I'm thankful for these people up here, and I'm especially thankful for a God who loves us dearly, who sent his son to die for us on the cross and die for my sins and your sins. So let's stand and let's worship him this morning.
sing it, church. Like a seal on your arm, for love is as strong as death. It's jealousy unyielding as the grave. It burns like a blazing fire, like a mighty flame. And many waters cannot quench this love, and rivers cannot sweep it away.
Lord, for your goodness, for your kindness, for your faithfulness, Lord. Not just then, not just back in the good old days, or not just yesterday, but right now. Right now, you're good, and you are faithful, and your word is true. And Lord, we, we love you so much, Lord. We are so grateful for your presence, Lord, for your goodness, your faithfulness. That's forever, 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 and forever. Yeah.
that your goodness is forever. I thank you, Father Lord, that the steadfast love of the Lord never ceases. His mercies never come to an end. Thank you, Father Lord, that you are always steadfast, that you are always good. You are always good. And we can, Lord, be thankful, not in just some circumstances, but in all circumstances, Father. We worship you, Father. This morning is the sacrament of healing. And if you are needing healing in your body, in your spirit, in your um, whatever you're needing this morning, we invite you right now to come down for prayer and we just we thank you Jesus Lord that you said that you are the healer of the broken hearted binding all of our wounds Jesus and I thank you Father Lord that you care Father it says you even care about the sparrow Lord that we know that you care about every single aspect of our life thank you Father Lord
us this time of year also when we celebrate Easter coming up next Sunday and knowing today's Palm Sunday and his triumphant entry into Jerusalem and when he's really held as the King of Kings and the Lord of Lords and we just, you know, I just see Isaiah standing on those Judean hills and he looks out and he says, who hath believed our report and to whom is the arm of the Lord revealed? Surely he has borne our sorrows, he's carried our griefs, he was wounded for our transgressions, the chastisement of our peace was upon him and by his stripes we are healed. And as we celebrate today, we celebrate next Sunday, it's all about Him. And He is good. He is so, so good. But, um, you know, next Sunday is our offering for the Hear the Word, proclaim the good news, and praise His name. And we thank you for the gifts that's already come in toward the new sound system. And these guys, they deserve the best. Do you think they deserve the best? They deserve the best because they are the best. And... Um, we have been so blessed over the years with awesome, awesome talent. But uh, they don't wear out, but the stuff they sing through wears out. And uh, believe it or not, you just wouldn't know how broken some of this stuff is. And do you think they sound good now? Wow. Wait till this new sound system goes in. It is, they going to sound better. I'm going to sound better. We're all just going to sound better because it's all about sound in here. This is what we do. This is, this is what we do on Sunday morning. We sing, we praise His name, we preach His word, we proclaim it, and we just need the right sound to do it, right? So I know you're going to come next Sunday on Easter bringing your offering to the Lord, and it's just going to be marvelous, isn't it? I'm telling you. All right, it's just going to be marvelous, isn't it? Yes. All right. Woo! Sing it with me. What can wash away my sin? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. And what can make me whole again? Nothing but the blood of Jesus. Thank you. 
worship you, Lord. We glorify you. We honor you, Lord. Oh, and we sing, oh, precious is the flow that makes me white as snow. Pastor Buren's coming up. I want to encourage you. That, that's one of the things that is in me to do is encourage you. And there was a song a couple songs ago Jennifer sang so beautifully. And the, the prayer in there was come be a consuming fire in me till we are one. And I just want to encourage you that that prayer has already been answered. You don't have to wait on that prayer because the God of the universe dwells in you. And one of the things he said of himself in the scripture is he is a consuming fire. And that speaks to his holiness. You are holy because the God of the universe dwells in you. And I want to encourage you. There's no need to tarry for a breakthrough today. You are the breakthrough. The God of the universe dwells in you. So you are going to hear an incredible word today. Be encouraged. You are the light of the world. God loves you. The, the God wants you to know today how much he loves you. He already dwells in you. The work is finished. And you are going to hear an amazing word. Just be encouraged. Let him who has ears to hear, hear what the Lord is saying. Hear what the Spirit is saying. So be encouraged today. You are one with God. You are of God. Jesus loves you. Amen. Lynn, that's your word. You just buy into that word right there that you were asking me to pray for you about. That's your answer right there. Morning. Someone asked me this morning uh, how long my father's been gone, and uh, it's been about 17 years, but yesterday would have been his 94th birthday, and I couldn't help but thinking so much about him this morning when I was singing that song, Nothing But the Blood of Jesus, because that was one of his favorites, that one in Blessed Assurance, and I could just hear him singing it. It sounded like a hound dog, <laughs> but I'd love to hear that hound dog sing one more time but uh he loved he built his life on the fact that christ's crucifixion there's nothing more important to him than the fact that he died for him and he celebrated him like i've never seen anybody else celebrate jesus and i just love the way he said jesus uh we were blessed the other day to last week when jet um learned his bible verse and when he dusty videoed him he said i mean it, if you knew my dad he said god just like my daddy says god i mean exactly the way he says it and um 
I think the Bible verse was be strong, be brave, but God is with you. And uh, only Daddy Catherine Kuhlman could say God in two syllables, but uh, he emphasized it. Well, we're going to go back to the book of James. We're going to next week take a break, going back to the I Am series because we're going to talk about the Christ who was the I Am. And he was the bread of life. He was so many things, and we'll talk about that. But James is the Greek word for Jacob in the Old Testament. And the man who came up with this series, I have so uh, was glad that I was in his presence one time about 25 years ago. And his name was um, something. And he had this series on the book of James. And he took the book of James, and he took... Jacob's blessing in, in Genesis 49 and he paralleled it and showed how James was was showing all the different characteristics of those sons of Jacob and how that he took those characteristics and he went through and I was telling someone this week James to me as I'm restudying it it's like the Proverbs of the New Testament I mean it's just one truth after another one thing to do one thing to learn you know just bam 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 and today we're just going to look at a few verses but it's some of the most if we grab hold of this and do this wow it, we would really be something we would really find life a lot more simple if we'd go by these principles but uh, I want to look at Genesis 49 right quick he says because we're going to talk about two sons this morning Simeon and Levi and here's Jacob He's on his deathbed. We talked about Reuben last week, and Reuben was, uh, was to excel in strength and power. Uh, he was the firstborn, and so we saw last week how we are the firstborn because the Bible said we are his first fruits. And if Christ, he was the firstborn, then we are in Christ, and Christ is in us. And so what's his belongs to us, and so we're the firstborn. And so he wants you to excel, he wants you to hear. The Word of God is you're here this morning, and He wants you to adhere to the Word of God. Now, there's a lot of people who hear the Word. Every Sunday morning, they hear it. Now, it's one thing to hear it, and it's another thing to adhere to it. With me? So it says, Simeon and Levi are two of a kind. Their weapons are instruments of violence. May I never join in their meetings, and I never be a party to their plans. For in their anger they murdered men. They crippled oxen just for sport. A curse on their anger, for it is fierce. A curse on their wrath, for it is cruel. I will scatter them among the descendants of Jacob, and I will disperse them throughout Israel. And then James takes it up in James chapter 1, verse 19. And he says this, Understand this, my dear brothers and sisters. You must all be quick to listen, slow to speak, and slow to get angry. Swift to hear, slow to speak, slow to anger. Wow, if we just take those three things, right? Remember the old the little monkey, see no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil? If we would just be slow, quick to hear, slow to speak. How many know most people aren't slow to speak? So he says, human anger does not produce the righteousness God desires. So get rid of all the filth and evil in your lives and humbly accept the word of God planted in your hearts for it has the power to save your souls. It has the power to save your souls. And what I want to talk about today really is the importance of our soul being saved. You see, God didn't redeem us send his son to the cross, die that cruel death, be beat and spat upon and ridiculed and treated the way he was treated so that you could escape hell. He didn't die that brutal death so that you could go to heaven. He did all of that so that he could save your soul. Your intellect and your will and your emotions could be whole. That you could experience a life here on this planet that is an exceptional life. That's a life way above any other life. He did it because he wanted you to know 
That life is not to be a life of boredom and, and pain and misery, but he wants it to be an abundant life. And that's why he did what he did. But James says, you know, you've got to be, first of all, swift to hear. And what that simply means is you need a teachable spirit. And he uses the medical term when he says, get rid of the filth. Well, that word filth is a medical term for wax in the ear. So he said, get the wax out of your ear so you can hear. And when he talked about evil, he wasn't, we talk about evil, we think of something horrible. Evil is simply wrong motives. And so he says, I want you to get the wax out of your ears so you can hear. And I want you to get rid of the wrong motives and just have the right motives in your life. Now, if God gave us two ears and one mouth, right? Well, I would think that if he gave us two ears and one mouth, then he wants us to hear twice more than we speak. And if we just always remember why he gave us two ears, and says, because he wants us to hear more and listen more than he wants us to talk. You see, I found out several years ago going through a change of mindset and things that I found myself not talking as much as I used to talk. When I found myself trying to become a positive Christian and believer and a more positive one, I found out that I had to start listening more and speaking less because I was training myself to speak differently than I used to speak. So he says, be swift to hear and slow to speak. Let's look at some scriptures right now and have a little fun. In Proverbs chapter 10, I love these scriptures. Too much talk leads to sin. Be sensible and keep your mouth shut. <laughs> it's pretty, pretty wise scripture, isn't it? My daddy used to say this, It's better to be thought a fool than open your mouth and remove all doubt. <laughs> Those who control their tongue will have a long life. Opening your mouth can ruin everything. Right, Mike? <laughs> the laundry room <laughs> got you. Mike said the other week, man, that laundry room's got me in more trouble because he said something he shouldn't be saying in the laundry room and somebody heard him. Even fools are thought wise when they keep silent with their mouths shut. They seem intelligent. <laughs> there is more hope for a fool than for someone who speaks without thinking. Wow. Wow. More hope for a fool than someone who speaks without thinking. You know, it's a real simple thing. Think, then speak. Not speak, then think. How many have ever found themselves speaking before they even thought about what they're about to say? They just went by their emotion of that moment and didn't even think about what was coming out, how it was going to sound, who it was going to affect, who was going to hear it, what it was going to mean. But if we just think about it before we speak it, wow. I, I find myself um, oftentimes preaching and wishing I had not said something the way that I said something. I remember years ago preaching and I, I didn't tell anybody. I just wrote it down because God just spoke it to me right, right after I said it. And... Uh, he said, I didn't say that like that. That's not how I said that. You said it in a different way than I really said it. So I found out that when I started reading Jesus' words that I wanted to get more than just the words off the paper. I wanted to get the spirit that was said behind the words. Because it's just, it's more to be said about the spirit of something than what was said. That's why text can get a little bit wacky. And emails can get a little bit wacky. Because you can get a text and you don't know how they said it. Have you ever read a text and you, and you read it one way and they said it, they texted it another way? I read a text and how'd they mean that? What do you mean by that? And so, because you don't get the spirit of it. And so we, we have to know there's more to, to life than just saying what we say. Let's say it right. Let's say it right. Slow to wrath. 
What does that mean, be slow to wrath? Have an open spirit. Now here's, these are just some things I, I jotted down, I believe will help you be slow to wrath. How many want to be slow to wrath? All right, do the opposite of these things. Angry people are strongly opinionated people. Strongly opinionated. I got an opinion. I got an opinion about that. Let me tell you what I think about that. They're dogmatic. My way or the highway. I know it. I've got all the truth. I know what I'm talking about. Intolerant of other people's views. It's okay for someone to think differently than you think. It's okay for them to have another view. And then vindictive or bitter people. We'll be swift to hear. We'll be slow to speak and slow to wrath. Our lives are going to be a whole lot better. That's why he said, fathers, provoke not your children to wrath. Rather, bring them up in the nurture and the admonition of the Lord. Now, what I like about being a grandparent is because we're grander than all other parents. And we're wiser than all other parents. You're a parent, and that's great, but you're not a grandparent, then you're not wise yet. And so you need to listen to the grandparents, not parents, but grandparents, because they'll tell you how to raise your kid. And they'll tell you that if you, got, if you talk to an adult the way you talk to your child, that adult would hit you upside the head. You provoke your children to wrath sometimes the way that you yell at them. That's just my two cents worth, but it's really worth more than two cents if you'll take it. And you can believe in the grandparent or you cannot. It's up to you. That's how E.D. would have done it. Levi says, I'm not only going to hear, but I'm going to add here. And so he goes on to say, don't just listen to God's word. Don't just hear what he just said and forget it. Don't just hear the word and go out and yell at him anyway. Don't just hear the word and yet go out and do what the opposite of what he says. You must do what it says, otherwise you're only fooling yourself. If you listen to the word and don't obey, it's like glancing at your face in a mirror. You see yourself and you walk away and you forget what you look like. Have you ever saw anybody that you knew they did that? And you saw them, you knew. They looked at the mirror, but they just took a glance. They didn't dwell there long enough. If they had, they would have seen some things that needed to be fixed. You see yourself and you walk away and you forget what you look like. But if you carefully, it look, if, you look, if you look carefully into the perfect, now listen to these words, the perfect law that sets you free, and we'll talk about the perfect law in a minute, and if you do what it says, and don't forget what you heard, then God will bless you for doing it. If you hear the word of God, and you dwell on it, and you go out and you obey the word of God, he says, oh, you'll be blessed for doing it. You see, God's word, I think I said it last week, you obeying God's word doesn't, affect God one way or the other doesn't make him more God doesn't make him less God he's God and he's he's God obeying it is for us he didn't give us scriptures and, and, and principles for him it's for us for our the, Moses said this is for our good always but the way that we do that the way that God has for us to hear the word and do the word is this. Now, you gotta, I want you to listen real closely what I'm about to say because either you're going to uh, fully understand this and get this and it's going to so change your life or you're just going to forget it. And I don't want you to. And I want you to be able to know why I believe what I believe with every fiber of my being, why I believe it. 
And why, why I adhere to it more so now than I've ever done in my life is because it's what God's Word says. Now here is how God, in the Scriptures, has said that we will hear the Word of God and we'll go and obey the Word of God. It said that God gave apostles and prophets and pastors and teachers for the perfecting of the saints, for the equipping of them, that we all may come to the unity of the faith, to the fullness of the statue of Christ, that we be no more children tossed to and fro by every wind of doctrine, but we may grow up into Him with every ligament and every part of the body working together, edifying of itself in love. He even talked about speaking the truth in love. And so he says he gave these callings, these different avenues, if you will, of preaching and teaching the Word of God so that we could be equipped. Now, he told Timothy, he said, Timothy, I want you to preach the Word. I want you to be instant in season and out of season. And then he said these words, reprove, rebuke, exhort with all long suffering." For the time will come when they will not endure sound doctrine, but shall heap to themselves teachers having itching ears. I'm going to qualify that in a moment. He told him another passage of Scripture. He says, Timothy, from a child, you've known the Scriptures, which are able to make one wise. For all Scriptures given by inspiration of God, and it's profitable for doctrine, for reproof, for instruction in righteousness, that the man of God may be perfect, thoroughly furnished unto all, good works so this is how Paul instructs young Timothy to help people be equipped you see when I preach the word or teach the word or someone else preaches the word or teaches the word or you're reading the word the word in itself will bring the correction to an individual's life that it needs to be brought without me pointing fingers at you my daddy used to say remember if you're gonna be a finger pointing preacher that when you point that finger out there, you got four more pointing back at you. And I don't want to be a finger pointing preacher. I want my job, my calling, is not to tell you what you're doing wrong. My job is to tell you what we need to be doing right. It's not my job to tell you what you're doing wrong. It's my job to tell you what you need to be doing right. In Isaiah chapter 58, he, he tells Israel, he says, I want you to know about your fasting, that your fasting is not what it ought to be. Let me just look that up right quick. Your fasting is not the fast that I want you to have. He says, this is the fast that, you, that you're doing. He says, while you fast, you keep oppressing your workers. What good is fasting when you keep fighting and quarreling? This kind of fasting will never get you anywhere with me. You humble yourselves by going through motions of penance, bowing your heads like reeds bending in the wind. You dress in burlap, cover yourselves with ashes. Is this what you call fasting? Do you really think that will please the Lord? Listen, no. This is the kind of fasting I want. Free those who are wrongly imprisoned. Lighten the burden of those who work for you. Let the oppressed go free. Remove the chains that bind people. Share the food with the hungry. Give shelter to the homeless. Give clothes to those who need them. And do not hide from relatives who want your help. <laughs> Here they come. Oh, God. <laughs> then your salvation will come like the dawn, and your wounds will quickly heal. Your godliness will lead you forward, and the glory of the Lord will protect you from behind. Then when you call, the Lord will answer, Yes, I am here. I will quickly reply. I will not be apologetic. I will not apologize anymore for preaching a message of grace and of mercy and telling you how much God loves you and telling you how that you can be everything that He wants you to be. I don't need to tell you what's wrong with you. You know what's wrong with you. I need to tell you what's right with you so that if you know what's right with you, then you can be right because you're only going to do and be what you believe that you are. Amen. Only. And it's the word, if, if, if you need correcting, you cut, you'll get corrected. 
How many's got GPSs in the car? How many ever make the wrong turn? And I don't, you know, this lady, well, no matter where you are and what GPS you got, she talks the same way. And she'll say, recalculating, recalculating. Not one time has she ever said, you idiot, you stupid moron. No, she says, recalculating, recalculating. Just make this next turn. Make the next turn. Turn left. Thank you. Thank you for not yelling at me. Thank you for just being nice and kind. When we were in the sea years ago, and the boat capsized, and, and uh, the Coast Guard came and got us. Got in the boat. The Coast Guard didn't say one negative thing to me. Matter of fact, all he did was encourage he, one thing he said was, man, I tell you what, we came out about two miles, but when we got out two miles, we fell into another ocean. And he said, that's what happened, you guys. At two miles out, it felt fine, but two more, then as soon as you got past that two miles, man, you just dropped into another ocean. I'll never forget, he looked at me, he said, now, we was coming up to the, close to the docks, and he said, now, there are going to be cameras there, going to be news people there, and you don't have to talk to them. You don't have to talk to them. Oh, no, not beard. <laughs> oh, no, no. I look at cameras every day, every week. Cameras don't bother me. So I'm walking, the newsman comes and says, Can I talk to you, sir? Sure, you can talk to me. And they interview, and then they put it on TV, and I look like the biggest idiot, moron fool. Now, he misquoted me. He didn't say what I said because they want you to look like an idiot. They even said, these guys should never have been out there. But that Coast Guard is trained to do one thing, save your life. He's not trained to get out there and get on your case because you did something dumb and stupid. He's there to save your life life and Jesus Christ came to this earth he came to this planet not to condemn you but that you might be saved for God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son that whosoever believes in him would not perish but have everlasting life so he sent not his son into the world to condemn the world but through him the world might be saved hallelujah Oh, I don't, I need you to beat me up. Well, you're going to have to go somewhere else. That's not my job. It's not my job to beat you up. Well, we caught him right in adultery, Jesus. Caught this woman right in a, the act of d adultery. Number one, what were you doing in them chambers to find them right in the act of adultery? You was out of place to start with. What are you doing there? We called him right at caught her. Well, where's the man? Did she, was she by, how did she commit adultery by herself? Where's the man? Because they were men and they were prejudiced and they weren't going to bring the man in. They're just going to bring the woman in. Yep. And so Jesus looks at him and says, Okay, who is out without sin? Go ahead, pick a stone and throw it. Nobody could throw a stone because nobody was without sin. Jesus looked and they all began to walk away and Jesus looked at her and said neither do I condemn thee because the only person who had the right to pick a stone up was Christ and he chose not to he chose not to because he was the only one without sin okie dokie now what is the law what is the law the law is transgression of the law. And the law is, Thou shalt have no other gods before me. Thou shalt not take the name of the Lord your God in vain. Thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not kill. Don't bear false witness against your neighbor. Jesus comes along. And they said, God, what, what, what's the greatest commandment of all? He said, Love the Lord your God with all your heart, with all your mind, with all your soul with all your strength and love your neighbors yourself and take everything that's ever been said and written hang it on those two laws hang it on those two laws love God and love your neighbor because when you see the Ten Commandments the first four is your relationship with God the next six is your relationship 
with other people. The law, the perfect law, is the perfect law of love. Perfect love casteth out all fear. He didn't send the law that we be under the law. He sent the law that we be in the law. Not under it, in it. Blessed is the man who walks not in the counsel of the ungodly, nor standeth in the way of sinners, nor sitteth in the seat of the scornful. But his delight is in the law of God. And in his law, he meditates day and night. And he'll be like a tree planted by the rivers of waters, who give forth his fruit in his seasons, and his leaves shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth shall prosper. Christ in us, the hope of glory. And if you'll focus, how many has heard about replacement thinking? Well, let me give you a new phrase. Replacement behavior. Replace bad behavior with good behavior and you'll be fine. You just got to replace it. And what the, how the scripture, what it's all about is that so we can focus on what is right and see what is good because if we do, we'll do it. The Bible says the strength of sin is the law. And if you look at it long enough, you will, you will, you'll crumble like a cookie. You will. It was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. That's what Paul said in Galatians. The law was our schoolmaster to bring us to Christ. He don't want us to focus on what we're not to do. He wants us to focus on what we should do. I know I've told this story so many times, but my dad was superintendent of the buses at Spalding County years ago, and the worst thing they ever did was put the rules of the bus in, up, up, up there. And the kids, they got on the bus, and after riding the bus all these years, they get on the bus, and there's these ten, literally they had ten rules up there. No chewing gum. No throwing paper out the window. <laughs> what do you think a kid's going to do when he sees no throwing paper out? Yeah, you know what I did? When we were crumbling up paper going. <laughs> Just because it said don't do it. Man, there was more paper thrown out. If they had never put that rule up there, them kids would have never thrown paper out the window. It wasn't any fun until they told me not to do it. But if I focus on what I should do, that's when I'll be doing it. On righteousness. On the perfect law of liberty. Okay, I know you're not getting it. So, you were dead because of your sins. Because your sinful nature was not cut away, then God made you alive in Christ, for He forgave all of our sins. He canceled the record of the charge against us and took it away, nailing it to His cross. In this way, He disarmed the spiritual rulers and authorities. He shamed them publicly by His victory over them on the cross. So don't let anyone condemn you for what you eat or drink or for not celebrating certain holy days or new moon ceremonies or Sabbaths, for these rules are only shadows of the reality yet to come. And Christ Himself is that reality. Don't let anyone condemn you by insisting on pious self-denial or the worship of angels, saying they have had visions about these things. Their sinful minds have made them proud, and they are not connected to Christ, the head of the body, for He holds the whole body together with its joints and ligaments, and it grows as God nourishes it. You have died with Christ. He has set you free from the spiritual powers of this world. So why do you keep on following the rules of the world, such as don't handle, don't taste, don't touch? Don't, don't, don't. I read this somewhere. Law exposes problems. Love Bring solutions. Rules. See violations. Love brings redemption. Rules excludes. Love includes. So what does James say in the end? Receive with meekness the engrafted or implanted Word of God in your heart. What is that? 
It's the rules and laws that God said are no longer be on tables of stone, but I'll write them on your heart. And when you feel that and you sense that, just you'll humbly accept that that is better for you than what you're thinking about. Receive with meekness. Humble yourself this engrafted word. And be doers of it. It's just practical applications of it. Just be doers. And then continue in it. Let it be a daily, weekly, monthly routine that I hear it, I obey it, and I keep on doing it. But while the way I'm going to do that is I am going to believe within it the love of God with all my heart. It's the reason I said the other week, I don't believe in the devil. I believe there is one, but I don't believe in him. I'm not going to put my trust and my confidence and believe in him. I believe in Christ. I believe in God. And you'll find out in a couple of weeks, James said, the devil believes there is a God. And he trembles. But he doesn't believe in God. He just believes there is one. There's a lot of people who believe there is, there is God. But they don't believe in him. See, when you know that you believe in something, you ready? You know you believe in something. How many believe in exercising? All right, how many do it? If you believe in it, you do it. If you believe in eating right, then you do it. Because I believe in it. I believe in it. If you believe in it, you get in it. You believe in it, you get in it. And I want you to believe in a God who loves you more than you could ever begin to imagine how much he loves you. He loves you so much that he can't see anything about you but good. Nothing about you but good. I remember so many times, I can't, and Keith to tell you, and Mike Thurston, Mike Oliver, the first things I taught them, I want you to know how to do a funeral. Because we do funerals differently around here. And I want you to know how to do one. I remember Michael Thurston came on board. I grew up, Michael said, come on, you're going to a funeral with me today. I said, why? I said, because you're going to learn how to do funerals. If you're going to be a part of this staff, you're going to do it this way. And he saw the funeral and after it was over. I said, you got it? He said, I got it. And I've seen him do it. He's got it. I've seen Keith do it. He's got it. Because I was criticized for years. How could you get up and say all those wonderful things about that person? You, didn't, you must not have known them. Wow. I am not going to be an abusive pastor any more than I'm going to be an abusive parent. And I've been both. I've been an abusive pastor. I've been an abusive parent. But I choose not to be either. Because God didn't call us to do that. He called me to be a priest who brings people to God and God to people.
He said, Your thy word, Lord, is a lamp unto my feet, and it's a light unto my path. It's not a flashlight to shine in your face, to condemn you, to harm you. It's a light to shine at your feet so you'll see where you're going and you'll go in the right direction. And don't let anyone, when you walk out of these doors, you go out into a world filled with judgmentalism, critical attitude, critical spirit, don't let anybody, don't let them trick you. Don't let them deceive you. Because that's not how God is. Don't let people tell you this positive stuff. Man, it just doesn't work. Well, do the negative then. See if that works. Don't let the world dictate what you believe. Let this mind be in you, which is also in Christ. When Waco, Texas happened, the compound was there. I, today I wouldn't say it. I wish I hadn't said it then. But what I said happened, and I knew why it would happen. And I told Barbara, I said, that compound is going to go up in a flame of fire. And she said, why? I said, because this is a destructive theology, and destructive theology destroys and he's got a destructive theology. And it wasn't but a few days after that, tanks barreled into that place and bloated up. Fire and smoke, killing innocent kids. Because of some man's destructive theology telling them it's what wasn't true. It cost lives. Destructive theology will always cost lives. And I'm not here to destroy you. I'm not here to take away from you. We're not here to tell you what you need to do or not to do. You know. We're just to do the truth. Love God with all your heart, your mind, your soul, your strength. And love your neighbor as yourself. Paul went on to say, Oh, no, no man nothing but to love him but to love him. There's plenty of abuse in the world. And there's not anything worse than abuse. So, worship team's coming. This is not the place to be abused. I've asked God more than once over the years to forgive me for abusing his sheep. I'm going to endeavor as long as I live not to harm another one. Not to abuse. I think Jesus said it's something like this. It's better a millstone be tied around your neck and thrown into the depths of the sea than offend one of my little ones. He is good. He is good. And he's not angry anymore. He was. You read the God of the Old Testament. Oh, he 
was angry. But there's a scripture in Isaiah 53 that, wow, it blows your mind. How could it, what did God mean when he said, it pleased God to beat him? The only thing that ever appeased God's anger was the death of his son on the cross. And once Jesus died, everything was appeased. And then the whole world now is going to be saved because of the kindness of God that leads men to repentance. Wow. Let's stand together. Let's... Ushers are coming to see the offering. It's tough. I just want to ask you to do this. As we're singing this, closing out this service, will you just open your heart, just, just open it up? And you say this, God, I desire and I want more than anything else to know the truth. And John said in John chapter 7, verse 17, Anyone who desires to know the truth will know the truth, whether it be of God or not. And you ask yourself to just open up your heart to let the truth of God resonate and rule in you. Amen. Just, just love on God for a moment. <clears throat> Pray.
precious blood that my Jesus spilled. 